Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. And while we're waiting for the new host to take over my duties on this channel, um, I wanted to surface a recent video for you that I did with housing analyst Melody Wright. It's a really important discussion, folks, because Melody basically did a forensic analysis of the hottest real estate markets right now. She literally got in her car, drove to these markets, real boots on the ground intelligence, and realized that there's a lot of inventory that is not making its way into the official reporting system, which basically means that uh, everybody looking at the real estate market right now, from the top analysts uh, to realtors to just regular home buyers and home sellers, are likely dealing with imperfect information, which is likely eventually going to manifest itself in potentially much lower housing prices. So without further ado, here's Melody Wright. What I feel like we're writing on right now is a wave of narrative and, and what's happening and, you know, I don't want to come out and say people are, are doing wrong things, but I will say that there's vested interest out there. Right. And so having a spec community and not filing the certificate of occupancy or not listing it for sale, you know, then it doesn't really exist. Right. And, and that's what I'm starting to see on the road. Meaning um, if, a, if a home sells for a lower price, but they never submit the certificate of occupancy, nobody really knows. Or if they just hold it off the market completely and they okay. don't because and so there's and I think one of the hardest things about all of this is there's not one scenario. You know, a lot of people look back and say subprime caused the last crisis. That's that's not accurate. It was, you know, it was the kindling that started the fire. But the real foreclosure crisis came to your prime borrowers after, you know, uh, credit quality degraded due to affordability issues. And the Fed's written a ton of papers on this, you know, that I won't make that, we won't go there right now. But but honestly, these spec homes, I, I've, I've started to realize this is, so typically what you do is you build custom, like someone comes and says, hey, I want to build a house. And maybe you choose a model and then you write a contract and you build it. But these spec homes that were being built for built to rent, and um, and for short term rental, there weren't contracts. And so these builders don't like if they never file that certificate of occupancy, it's almost like they don't exist or they exist. If you've seen that permit data where it shows kind of starts and completions and then the pig and the snake, which mm -hmm. is the all in progress. <laughs> well, I think it's that's where they all are, except I actually believe that probably some of those permits weren't even filed. There's some lawsuits out there right now uh, about that. Um, but I, I think they exist, Adam, but we don't know about it. Like when I was in Round Rock, Texas, for instance, th that's a suburb of Austin and, and got a lot of interest because Amazon was going to build a warehouse there. They canceled those plans. But I would I would drive a mile down the road and there would be a new build site, a new build site, a new build site, you take a right, another one and another one. And then I would sit down with people while in Austin, you know, people that work in the hotel, wherever, and I talk to them and, and they say, no, those are all sold. I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> you know, you go to the website, they're not all sold. We heard back in the, um, back earlier in the year, it, it was a Twitter user named Raleigh fans. And he said kind of what was happening is they, as he worked as uh, in new, in, in new home sales is that they would just find whoever they could write a contract because that's all that you have to do. And, and those contracts mean nothing. That's not underwriting. That's just write a contract, write a contract, make it look like you've sold it. It goes on as sold on the lot. Um, and then, you know, it doesn't matter if they can qualify because we just have to make our numbers each month. And that's kind of, and again, this was an anonymous account. I'm still in touch with him. He's at a major national home builder right now. Um, and the other thing that he told me that they do, and I've also had this confirmed with other realtors and things like that, is they'll put different color stickers on the home saying sold. But in reality, they know green means sold and red means that it's not really sold. And, and they'll do things what's called salting the lots. They'll make it look like people are actually those homes have sold. One thing I saw in Austin that they did. So firstly, you always have the construction people and the people working in the office will kind of drive in and they'll park in the house, like at each of the houses to make like, and they'll pull the garbage cans down, like the, the recycling can and the garbage can to make it look like someone lives there. 
but you typically could tell because there'd be a light on. And this was another thing that people told me is like, the, there's always some way to distinguish which ones are sold and which ones aren't. Now, again, who's at fault here? I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, this, some people would just say this is, it's just a marketing gimmick, right? Um, it, but it, it all adds up. And then I kind of go back to technology systems. So technology and mortgage and, and at these builder sites is abysmal. Like it is, it's terrible. Um, it's maybe Excel spreadsheets where people type things in. And so half the time you, you don't know what's actually going up to corporate, right? Like, and, and on, a, so I think that there's a combination of people that have no idea what they're doing, filling out these sheets. And then there's people that probably know what they're doing. That's filled, because, you know, it's when your paycheck depends on it, it's important to take, you know, the rosiest view of everything. Right. And so I'm, I'm not saying people are doing thing, anything wrong, but when I, I will tell you that I came back completely mystified how anyone could say that there was an inventory shortage. And a reporter from a very large publication called me and said, we're gonna do this story. And we were working on it. And we were talking to the builders, we were talking to a technology platform out there that said they had every new build on their platform. But I called them from Austin and I said, wait a minute. All right, let's talk about Sweetwater. What about that? Oh yeah, well, okay, what about out in Maynard? Oh yeah, yeah. So basically, they they started the conversation saying every single one of those homes are going to be occupied. But every time I brought up one of these subdivisions that I had seen that, by the way, Sweetwater out in Austin, Texas, I mean, these aren't 400,000. These are over 600 to a million and more. And they just kept building them up in the hills. Um, they, they would admit that was an issue. And so it's like almost... It, it, I think that when we look at things in aggregate, it's very difficult um, to really see what's happening below. And and I pressed them specifically about local private builders, and I got no answer. So I did a lot of, as I was out there trying to call people in my industry, trying to understand what was I missing, you know? And, and honestly, what I came, or what I concluded was, I'm not missing anything. <laughs> I guess I can see how that could work where, you know, for a little while, right, where you're making your bosses look like you're hitting your numbers and they're able to yeah. tell on their next earnings call, oh, yeah. we've got a sell-through rate of whatever. But at some point, the money doesn't come through. That's right. <laughs> like when, when when does the jig up? I think too, it's, it's really important to understand all the players. And I think what a lot of people are missing were these private builders that bought, that I'm sorry, that built specifically for things like built to rent and short-term rental. You know, so let's take the institutionals like American Homes for Rent. You know, they went out and said, hey, I want like this many homes in these areas they've now become net sellers of those. And so there's it's it, there's just a lot of different players in the market. And I think like in this, what, the example that you give, you know, I don't think the national builders, like that wouldn't work out for long, just like you're saying. I mean, they have to, report, if the money doesn't come in. Well, I can, I, I talk a lot about the drug of gain on sale. And what that is, is, Essentially, in our industry, you can book your revenue very early on, like at that initial kind of application, and it just becomes a, a drug that papers over any other loss. And what happened in late spring is our financial media decided they wanted to help the builders. And like um, a specific reporter, I won't name names, came out with a big series of articles in Bloomberg about, hey, go out and get a new build because you're going to get a 15 to 20% net reduction in price. You're going to get all kinds of incentives. Like they're going to pay your solar for a year. And so I think as we had the 10 year and the 10 year is very important and across the world, right. But <laughs> very important in the, the housing space, we had the 10 year start running up and I thought for sure it's over for the builders because the way they do modeling within those organizations. And so then we got a little bit of that relief in the spring. Then you had kind of these articles come out and I think it was able to kind of like slow the the crisis down as well as um, just so you, this was something I had to, I came home and I looked at every builder's balance sheet. I was, I thought how on earth could this 
be possible. I know a lot of these people, okay, <laughs> from the industry. <laughs> and and they do this song and dance where they're like, we learned our lessons, you know, like every single earnings call is the same. And our balance sheets are strong. Not if you have to take a 50% write down, they're not. Nobody's balance sheet is that strong. So, you know, I basically just kind of realized what they're doing is cost modeling. And so if a project that's complete um, is not making 10% a margin, then they have to fair market value it. But otherwise, they can just let it sit within the models. And so if they're not selling it at all, then they don't really have to make a decision about fair market value. And so it's very difficult when you go into their Q's and K's trying to find these little projects where they are. You can't find it. Uh, and, and so I think they're able to paper over a lot of stuff in aggregate because there's just no need if you think about. So I'm just going to give you a theoretical. I can't prove it right now, but I'm a big national builder. I've got a massive spec site, um, maybe one that I just visited out there. I haven't sold any homes, but in reality, on my balance sheet, it's just land right now. I mean, I've got expenses happening in SGNA or whatever, but nobody really knows that all those houses are built. And so I'm not doing any type of fair market value because if I'm not selling, I can use my cost model. And so I'm, I'm, it, I know this may sound like a, a little confusing, but it, it comes into how do you, you know, how are they really valuing these things? And so that that's an explanation where it's not it's not fraud. It's just they can almost pretend like it's just land. And they a lot I've been told by people in the industry, they especially do that near the end of the year, because that way they're just taxed on the land versus on huh. the house. Yeah, on the house. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it is a little bit of accounting shell game, if you will. Presumably yes. there's an end date on that, though, right? I mean, they, oh, they, 100%. they, they, they have they, they've, they've spent the cost to build this thing. Right. Having it just sort of sit there not generating income, depreciating, needing maintenance, stuff like that. They 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 can't do that forever. That's not a profit. That's not, not a way to run a business, right? Yeah. And yeah. The MLS listings were saying there was a certain level of of homes for sale. But when you went there and you actually looked at what was going on, you saw that there were vastly more units for sale than what was being reported. And of course, the media, which sort of sets the narrative for the the masses is keying off the publicly available data like the right. MLS listings. So it's right. kind of reporting data that yeah. that doesn't really match reality. So give us the full story on that. Yeah. So when I got back in February, I was as confound. I just was so confused. So I started really digging into Zillow, Redfin, Realtor.com. What are the differences between the three? And what I soon came to find out is that essentially there's over 600 individual MLS sites in our country. Um, and most and no one has a connection to all of them. And when you look at Zillow and Redfin in comparison to Realtor.com, which is what the Fed uses, they actually use Realtor.com's uh, numbers, by the way, they're owned by the same people as the Wall Street Journal. Um, they use those numbers. Uh, you can see that Zillow and Redfin don't have as many listings. And it's because they of the aggregators that they choose. So out there, you can choose certain people that are aggregating these individual MLS sites. But then you start digging even further and you realize, OK, even if you had all 600, you still wouldn't have all the listings because you, when you start to talk to people in the industry, you realize typically the MLS only has about 70 to 80 percent of listings because there's things called pocket listings. And then we heard about these these folks that were really these brokers in mortgage that were really they hired a builder built those for themselves they never made it onto a listing site they they would sell these thing, things on facebook like hotcakes like i have a great twitter space out there of a guy this happened to like one property went got sold in an hour on Facebook that never made it to an MLS listing site. And so there's just a ton that we don't understand. And it does come back to the data. So that's, I just wanted to lay that out there because uh, I want people to understand that, that it's, especially if they're looking for a house, they need to go to realtor.com. They're going to have more listings there. Um, but I was going to get to kind of like what happened recently where I could, you know, really see this as an illustrative example, which is, 
um, I went to a community that's a 55 plus community that had been featured in a local news article. I'm down here in the Miami area uh, working with a client. And what had happened is that all the residents of this massive community, over 9,000 people based on what they say on their website, um, got a letter that said, you know, uh, your costs, your HOA fees are going up due to skyrocketing insurance costs and police had to be called. Uh, I mean, because everybody kind of stormed the office building saying they can't afford it. And they got on the news channel saying, you know, I can't afford this. I'm going to have to list my house. And so I went to that community and I went to the listing sites to see what I could see that was for sale in that community. And it was about 16 uh, that I could find on the one that has the most. But then when I went to that community site, they had over 100, most listed of around 130, most listed for sale, some listed for rent. Um, so right there was kind of a case study of for existing homes that, you know, these folks, because at the end of the day, too, people that have a home and are listing it for sale, they they also have a vested interest, right? And maybe not making it as public as possible because... <laughs> the more that are listed out there, that's more competition for them as well. And so if I can not even have to pay, a, it's just a tiny am amount of money, but still, if I don't have to pay to list on the MLS site, why don't I just do it on this local? Because so many people want in this community, theoretically, like I'll, I should be able to just sell it without it getting to a site. So that was one a recent example of with existing homes. And then the same trip, I just went right down the road to a new build site. And uh, there were all these homes almost completed, you know, just one little thing not done, but a lot of them were completed. I went to the listing sites to look for those new homes. They were nowhere to be found. Uh, there would there, there was one listed, one card, I'll say like a little card with like a little, you know, rendered photo listed for rent. And so it made me think that likely this community was probably a built to rent site. Um, but that was it. And there were, there were a lot of homes there over, you know, over 20 homes. The spec homes that you saw that, that weren't listed at all, that were being built as built to rent, you know, presumably that's being built by some relatively deep pocketed uh, company who's building all those, right? So in the past number of years, but certainly recently, right, we've had this really big surge in um, corporate capital coming into the residential housing market, right? Really? Um, with some really deep pocketed players like Blackstone and, and some of these you know, really big private equity firms. Um, and then, then just a whole range, you know, so it's not just mom and pops having one or two units. It's, it's deep pocketed corporations that have hundreds or thousands, right? Um, now rents are starting to come down. And if we have, if we have, all this inventory out there, you're saying that that is, is even more than what we're being told in the official data. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, home prices and rents should start coming down even further. You talked about the trajectory not being good, and you're nodding vigorously as I'm saying this, but I assume you are looking forward and saying, oh my gosh, all this sort of shadow inventory that's eventually going to have to come on the market is these people, these companies just have to start getting something for their investment. Um, it's really going to be pulling prices, sale prices and rental prices down from here. Um, you're nodding. So I'm going to let you respond to this in just a second. But okay. one of the concerns that I've been flagging, and I'm curious to see how much you may share it, is, uh, you know, I, I think the, 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 the institutional and corporate investors have really helped push the price of, of real estate up because as can't believe we've mentioned this already in this this conversation, but as I like to remind people all the time, housing is priced at the margin, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, one house in a neighborhood sells, it reprices comps for all homes in the neighborhood, right? So these guys are the deep pocketed all cash investors who can come in, buy inventory at a higher price than, than the average consumer can, because they've got deeper pockets, they've got the ability to borrow at cheaper rates. And they have the ability to enjoy economies of scale across their portfolio. So I can, if I don't get the best deal on this house I'm buying, that's okay because I'm I'm making money on this other part of my portfolio, right? right? So they're taking kind of like a long game and they're buying in volume, right? And that that's all help push stuff up. Personally, I think it's it's a societal uh, bad idea to have a, a meaningful percentage of your housing stock um, 
owned and, and operated by corporations when in other words in a, you know in, in a better world it would be owned and, and, and totally. maintained by individuals right. um but the the concern i'm getting to the risk i'm getting to is when 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 the market flips <laughs> and all of a sudden these guys are not making money on their thousands of units in fact maybe they're starting to really hemorrhage money on a lot of their units for them it's just business right they're not living in the house right um right. They just eventually, you know, somebody somewhere up in corporate says, wow, that division is just losing too much money. Yep. We just got to start chopping off limbs, get rid of that stuff. And yep. all of a sudden you could see hundreds of homes in a concentrated geographic region hitting the market within a short period of time and then just cratering price because all of a sudden supply has gone through the roof. How, how big a risk is that, do you think? Oh, I think it's a fairly big risk. And and I think that there's a little bit of shenanigans going on right now. Um, you know, we were seeing like Blackstone others being net sellers of a lot of this inventory. And then there was this big deal announced where they bought uh, Blackstone bought some Starwood, but that was an all in the family deal. And what I mean by that is that these guys also understand what's happening, right? And and they need to keep this as close as possible. And Starwood had already taken an $80 million write down on that at the beginning of the year. Um, and then let's let's talk in November what the actual purchase price <laughs> right, ends yeah. up being. Um, but and, and they had made Predium uh buy back some of the homes because it was originally a Predium deal. So they did a whole little all in the family, but these guys are already net sellers, like whether, you know, there, there's some moving around of things, but they are. And so they are already. Right, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to underscore ahead. that for people, because that okay. I think is a really important observation. You're saying that the institutional buyers who have been so influential in pushing prices up in recent years have now flipped to being net sellers. You're absolutely right, Adam. They don't care at all. Like, you know, they're going to they're going to come in, they're going to slash and burn. And in the, my case, uh, I was working at a top five originator and servicer back in 2006 when Cerberus purchased a majority stake. Um, the government bailed them out. So, you know, they don't care. Uh, and, and they they understand these markets fairly well, although they get caught upside down, uh, but they usually figure out a way to get out <laughs> to your point. <laughs> Whereas your regular consumer, one of my biggest concerns when Bloomberg was pushing all those stories about the new bills was that what I had been seeing is these all these in the mega sites, like all these empty homes, and you'd see one lone site with a for rent sign out there, like like that was complete amongst all this construction. So I just had all these nightmares about this young family like buying in one of these mega sites and it going completely, you know, no no other, you know, home being sold for like years because that's what happened last time as well, you know. And I, I want to mention a quick story. So sure. Lenar, uh, you know, you can go back. So Lenar got rescued a last cycle um, through kind of this tax thing. And there's a great article about how they learned their lesson. They were going crazy. They had a schedule of delivering like 35,000 homes, the most on record. And they and they just got out of control. This is what like the quotes in the article were saying, like we've learned our lesson. They're set to, to deliver almost 2.2 times that many homes this year. And we don't have the demographics to support it. And so what I want everyone to understand more than more than anything else is that no one learned their lessons. No one. And and they may believe they learned their lessons. And I can tell you because I talk to these people every day in my industry, they don't understand there's a lot of things happening. Like, for instance, the credit scores look inflated. You know, we know this, you know, like uh, due to things like since the GFC, medical debt's not really considered anymore. The, you know, student loans are on forbearance. You know, mortgages were on forbearance, uh, not being reported to credit. So credit scores look fantastic, but, you know, that's not a true indication. And and this is, and so Adam, one thing you may not know is that the GSCs have this thing called automated underwriting systems. And so you, you feed that information into it and it spits back to you, whether it's approved or what the, and so in many ways- it's starting to wrong, can you just, can, For the folks that don't know sorry, what the acronym stands for, can you just define GSE? Uh, government sponsored enterprises. Uh, they 
So this is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, right. um, that essentially were taking control of, you know, during the crisis. Okay. But, but they, they basically help lower income families get into uh, houses by giving them mortgage support. Well, and at this point, uh, what happened after the GFC is they became the only sort of uh, uh, people backing in our, in our huge securitization. So so the housing industry runs on securitization. You know, the GFC, there was a lot of private securitization with uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac with a piece of the pie. What's now happened is it's all GFC with a tiny bit of what we call non-qualified mortgages are private because everybody who said no more private mortgages. And so now it's not just first time home buyers. It's people with jumbo loans. It's everybody like they own a massive portion. I think it's somewhere like 90 percent, but I don't have okay. the numbers in front of me. So it's just very similar to sort of what's happened with education debt, right, where they pushed out the private lenders and it's pretty much now just the government. That's right. That's right. And so what's going to be very interesting this time, we call it government sponsored subprime. <laughs> because <laughs> ultimately what the, the fan, so the GSEs were ultimately kind of saying, yep, you gave us the data. Here's your pricing. Um, this is approved. Um, but, uh, it's based on things like these inflated credit scores. So it's going to be very interesting. And you're already seeing the narrative. Um, David Stevens, former head of Mortgage Bankers Association, coming out about all the reach purchase requests that the GSEs were doing. And so this is the other thing. You originate the loan, you sell it to them, but they have the ability to send it right on back to you saying you didn't dot your I, you didn't cross your T. And that's starting to happen, which happened at scale, which is actually what crushed my company to some degree, why we went bankrupt. Um, it's starting to happen and, and everybody's freaking out. And they're saying, but that's not fair, GSEs. You're not being a good partner in all of this. No, that's how they keep making money through, through, and they made money in the last default cycle, Adam, and they'll make money again. They were the ones that pushed all of that real estate owned that was in foreclosure to the investors, believe it or not. They started those auction programs started backing them. And so there's a lot of history here and a lot of things that people don't understand. It's a very complicated market. Market. How do you generally see this playing out? Um, will there be a material correction in the market? I, I have trouble imagining there wouldn't be one given from uh, you know much of what you've said. Uh, and if and whether whatever size correction, if any, you see, what's the timeline you think it's going to play out over? You know, is it going to be sharp and severe? Or should we be girding for like a multi-year, just grinding, grinding, grinding down process? I think it's going to be a longer grind. I really do, because I think politics are going to get in the middle. Um, and then I think I'm starting to see the distress right now in borrowers, uh, you know, doing what I call the death cross um, from 30 days to 30 plus. Uh, and I call it the death cross because they're giving up on their credit at that point. And we're obsessed with our credit in this country. And so we're already seeing, we initially saw FHA, VA getting under stress like around April, May, um, and then Fannie and Freddie joined the party. But when you go and look at all the um, kind of the sites that report on this stuff, they're just focusing on seriously delinquent is, is the lowest it's ever been, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's because it got taken care of by the COVID programs which are not going to be there when these borrowers get there. And, and, and I still look at client books and it's kind of compliment, combination of people who literally just can't afford it because of a hardship and investors, which is exactly how it started last time, Adam. I mean, that's what the subprime were. That was the investor class. And by the way, at my company, I know for sure, we didn't originate to lower credit scores. Um, and so it's just that it was the same thing. Everybody thought they were going to make a ton of money on rent, et cetera. And everybody's having a party, right? <laughs> and, and then the reality, when these home prices carry with it increased costs that nobody was prepared for, it started it. It started. the And so subprime, saying it was subprime kind of misses a lot, which is why everybody's missing what's happening this time. Got it. And you're... it sounds like you're saying what's going to happen is very similar to what happened last time, just different trigger. And ironically, not coming from the subprime part this time, but maybe coming from the super prime. Right? The super prime. Yeah. That's so, nice. you know, generals always fight the the last battle. Right. So everyone's looking at subprime and really maybe they should be looking at super prime. Um, and, and just make sure I understood you correctly. Uh, you're saying we're beginning to see a surge 
in delinquencies, meaning people not paying uh, right. their mortgages. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's at the early part of the timeline, right? right? It hasn't, hasn't gone out to the extreme just because right. we're, we're now just beginning to see the wave, but you would expect right. to see that continue to propagate out, right? Right. right. So to my earlier question about sharp and sudden versus kind of rolling grind, it sounds like you're, you're in more of the latter camp there, huh? Yeah, I, I think that certain things could happen uh, where it could go faster and certain things could happen where it could go slower. And so I'm kind of probably in the middle um, but the, 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 the person, the logical person in me says it, it has, it's going to have to happen and it's going to have to start happening at the end of this year. Okay. And of course, there's a word you and I haven't even mentioned yet, which is the word recession, right. <laughs> which is right. if we go into a recession with the concomitant job losses and all that stuff, presumably that just kind of adds gasoline to this That's potential right. dumpster fire, correct? That's right. And then, then you know, I think things do accelerate and it could be, because I like to say real estate is local until it's not. And what I've been saying recently, and it's until the shadow banks choke. And what I mean by that is the non-bank uh, sec, which does most of mortgage lending today, when they run out of liquidity, that could create all types of credit events um, that could accelerate all of this. So, all right. And can you just give an example of a shadow bank that does mortgage lending, just so people have an understand, understanding sure. what you mean by shadow bank? Sure. It's anybody that's not a bank. So Mr. Cooper, Rocket, United Wholesale, um, let's see, uh, Guaranteed Rate. Those That was the, kind of the top seven, those guys. Uh, those uh, it, New Res is another name. Um, and. and and, the, and a lot of people won't even know those names because they'll use a local broker who will then sell that loan to Rocket and UW, et cetera. And so those are the non-banks and they weren't here the last cycle in the way that they are now. And they don't understand servicing, which is what happens after the loan is originated, you know, the mm -hmm. taking the payments, that kind of stuff. And so they have, that's why they're all complaining about these tiny little repurchase requests they're getting right now. They have no clue what they're they're in store for because I like to say to people, regardless if these people go to foreclosure this year, you still have to start the engine. You still have to send all these state notices, federal notices. You have to review the bar. I mean, there's so much the servicers have to do. And that expense just mount. I In my client books, we're seeing expenses increase month over month, like from 10 to 25 percent, Adam, in Ooh. just a couple of months. And so people, they just, everybody's focused on the Fed and their narrative, and they're not even paying attention to their own metrics. And of course, everything's delayed by 30 days or 60 days. And so the industry itself is asleep and not even seeing what's going on. All right. Well, we're going to have to wrap it up here, but this has been fascinating, Melody. For folks that have really enjoyed this conversation, perhaps weren't familiar with you and your work beforehand, where can they go to follow you? Sure. So I'm on Twitter at M3 underscore Melody, M-E-L-O-D-Y. Um, also on LinkedIn, Melody Wright uh, at Substack, M3 Melody Substack, and on YouTube and a sad little channel. Uh, I think it's called uh, just Melody Wright <laughs> YouTube. And so uh, those are the places. And I, I I really do my best to respond to everybody. Um, I don't block people. Um so, you know, if you have a question and if you have to make a decision, please reach out to me because there are better decisions to make if you're forced uh, due to something that's out of your control to make a decision right now. So, Absolutely. Um, uh, and the big thing we talk about on the channel, too, is really making an informed decision with the support of informed professionals versus just making a decision in the moment driven by emotion. Those tend to always be the worst yes, ones. Everybody ask questions. Uh, don't make an emotional decision. You know, there are good decisions to make right now. So reach out to a professional or to me or someone and just, you know, talk it out. That you is give us last... a lot of reasons to do that in this one. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, Melody, thanks so much. We really look forward to having you back on again soon. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.